This is David Goodwin, Assistant Director at the Fordham University Center on Religion and Culture. Thanks for joining us again for the latest episode of our new series, CRC Chats. Joining us today is author and photographer, Chris Arnaud. Chris's book, Dignity, Seeking Respect in America's Back Row, was released in 2019 by Sentinel Publishing. Many thanks, for Chris, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So first of all, congrats on the book. It's, it seems to be getting a, a favorable press, favorable reactions from readers. Um, for those who are unfamiliar with it, what is Back Row America? Um, Back Row America is um, basically the bulk of America. It's the places that, uh, it's, the it's the people and the communities that generally get overlooked. Um, by by the press by the media um, and when they when they do get written about or talked about it's usually with a with the framework of something going wrong with it with a stigma quite simply it's, it's it's a school room metaphor it's the communities and the people who generally sat at the back of class um, <clears throat> as opposed to in contrast to what i call front row america which are the eager students who were always you know teachers pets always excelling at school um, the hall monitor types who, you know, are good people, but, you know, detach themselves in some ways from the bulk of Americans by, by their educational route. Um, people who've gone to the similar institutions, they come from very diverse backgrounds geographically, and they're, they're, they are themselves diverse, but they all share a common experience of having gone to, like, Harvard, Princeton, um, gotten a PhD, perhaps, um, and generally control much, <laughs> much of, there were much of our political class and our business elite. Um, and then there's the rest of, uh, rest of the, the, the United States, who I call back row Americans, who maybe dropped out of high school, um, maybe um, finished high school and that was it, or maybe they went to a local community college, or maybe they went to a smaller state school, or maybe they went to a trade school, um, but didn't go through those 20 educational institutions and didn't go get postgraduate degrees. And if, if they did get a postgraduate degree, it might have been something in nursing or something in, uh, yeah, something a little bit more, um, more skills oriented and less intellectual. And, and this division between the back row and the front row America, do you see that as um, a result or a manifestation of so sort of the neoliberal post capitalist America or is this is this something that's always been with us but we're just um, I think it something different now I think in some forms it's always been with us but it actually it, it's in many ways we've always had these divisions and it's generally been racial and it's generally been economic this division is different um, in that there's as much divide as there's ever been so it's this, it's this false meritocracy we've built the elites have built what I call a false meritocracy where and it's different in one very dangerous way, which is the, the idea that anybody can make it. So in prior systems, there was generally acknowledged that the elites were the elites and everybody else was everybody else. And that was just the way it was and, you know, suck it. <laughs> now, it's a, now it's generally this, this false, they've wrapped it, the elites have wrapped it in this sense of almost intellectual nobility that they're, they, they're deserving of this because they got, they got, they, they built a resume and anybody can build that resume and, any, and they have these credentials. See, I have this, I have this resume with all these credentials. I worked for it. I, I excel. I, I deserve this. And the implication of I deserve this because anybody can do this is if you didn't, if you, if you don't do it, you don't deserve it. And somehow it's your fault. Mm -hmm. and so in many ways, the system is, it gives a nod to being more fair and more diverse, but only a nod, which I feel at my most cynical is a way to basically inoculate the elite from the sense of uh, their privilege. They can simply say, what do you mean? I deserve this. <laughs> I, 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 got, I got a PhD from Harvard in internet studies. Why didn't you do that? Um, so it's not dissimilar in that there's a great amount of inequality still. There's a ruling elite who control the dialogue um, and run the dialogue and, there, and, 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 and there's a barrier to entry to that. But th they pretend that that barrier to entry is, is not a barrier. Um, and that's, that I think is the most dangerous thing about our, our current system. I, I mean, you mentioned this, this refrain or storyline that anyone can make it. 
why has that been accepted? Or at least uh, why has the culture at large been seduced by that narrative, do you think? I think we tend to find those who, who do make it and celebrate them, and for good reason. This wonderful story, you know, the, the you know, uh, uh, for, for people familiar with the Bronx, you know, the, the, the young man or the young woman who, who grows up in Hunts Point um, and goes through a, a, a series of schools, probably private Catholic schools early on, um, perhaps, um, gets, gets a scholarship to uh, Yale um, and then becomes successful. Those are great stories. But for every and they fell because it's a hard, it's a hard thing to do. Um, there's a lot of luck there. There's a lot of extraneous circumstances that need to happen. Um, and it's just also some people just don't want to do that. <laughs> you know, there's this term in an African American community called acting white. You know, to, to be I think a lot of a lot of a lot of blacks understand that if you want to be successful, you have to act white. Uh, I call it acting front row. To 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 become the elite, you have to take on all this behavior and and we can get to it in a little deeper but you have to also take on this whole philosophical framework that may be contrary to who you are mm. and it's just not your it's just not it's not your thing you know i mean you don't want to necessarily be a transient person who picks up roots and moves um and and and, and cuts and diminishes your obligations to your family or your community mm -hmm. you know a uh, perfect example I, I use of this is um you know, I told this story many times, but there's, during my project, you know, I did this for seven years, driving around the country, talking to people in these communities. It was a, it was a young woman, probably the age of your students at Fordham, um, who, who, who um, was in the McDonald's in East LA, very poor neighborhood. Um, you know, I, I knew exactly why she was in the McDonald's in East LA with her. So, you know, you can go. And she goes, well, I can't. I'm going to the East LA Community College because um, I need to stay here for my mother. Uh, I'm her translator. And a lot, as a lot of people know, the oldest, you know, for, for immigrants, the oldest student is, the oldest child is often the one who speaks both languages and, and acts. So she can't leave. Now, that's a perfect example of somebody who, if they were ever offered a scholarship to Yale, Princeton probably couldn't take it. Um, and so, you know, did she make the right choice? If that was her, if, if she had that choice, would that be the right choice or the wrong choice? I happen to think we as a culture should acknowledge that what she did was selfless and also was quite a wonderful act. And as important as somebody who picks up roots and goes to Yale um, and then, you know, comes back 20 years later to run a non nonprofit putting gardens on the roofs of houses in on point. <laughs> you know, I mean, and, and sells out in some senses, um, you know. To me, I feel like there's this frame. It's, it's this very colonial and paternalistic framework of that the elites have of you have to become like us. Everybody wants to, you know, aspire to. To flying jets around and going to Davos conferences and giving speak TED talks, mm -hmm. you know, other people have other frameworks of valuing who they are. So I think what's very frustrating to me is not is not a, the concept of anybody can do this is 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 presumption on the idea that everybody wants to do that, right? <laughs> you know, and, and how how might the the narrative or the norm be shifted in, in, in any way? if anyone can make it is the dominant narrative and we have this culture of the elites and the not elites or the back row on the front row, how, how, how do you see that changing anyway? Or have, do you see any signs of that changing in a positive fashion or maybe in a negative fashion? Do we see it hardening of the anyone can make it narrative? I think you get, if you get, whenever you get these hierarchies in history of what basically is a ruling elite who, who, 
who I think there's two things going on that I think the ruling, the, the front row, the educated elite, the political class, what you call them what you will, the, um, <clears throat> are, the framework is not very much different from the past. They control things um, and they um, limit membership to their group. The, the two things that kind of are important is how big is the gap between them and everybody else? Um, and how much is the punishment for not being them? How much do they punish you? Um, when, when that, whenever those two things get too large, people get sick of them, they overthrow them one way or the other. Um, you know, either, either the elite are going to change and they're going to wake up to the fact that a lot of people are unhappy with their dominance. They feel they're being punished too much. And that punishment comes, you know, I'm not talking about being flogged. I'm not talking about being, you know, it, it comes in many different, it, it's, it's basically feeling like an outsider. It's being told that you're lesser. It's feeling like you're not in the in-group. It's having limited access to so many things. It's mm -hmm. um, having your taste. It's not just economic, and there's that. Um, but it's also cultural. It's what you value and what you think is considered lesser. Uh, you, a very simple one that we can go to is faith. You know, the secular, the front row does not value religion. Um, it acknowledges it, but it doesn't value it. Um, and in general, the rest of the country values it a lot more. Um, not necessarily just through Sunday or Saturday or Friday night church membership, um, but through the way they think, the way they frame the, their analysis of issues, the way they solve problems is not to go get a textbook and read up on it. It's to use their life experiences and maybe go into the corner and pray and meditate um, or, 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 you know, light, it, light a candle. <laughs> you know, it's, it's about a much more intuitive framework of understanding the world, a much more, um, a much more sensory framework of, putting together your past experiences of how you've, how you've approached the, the world. It's not about running to the library and getting 15 books and reading on it. So, you know, and that's considered backwards. You know, if, if, if you can see it so many, in so many ways where the elites scold anybody who doesn't follow dogmatic intellectual, uh, you know, <laughs> the, current, the, current, the current scientific fact whatever that is and that you know so i think there's a great deal of punishment that people feel for being on the outside and you know one of the things i i happen to be very front row i got a phd in physics i work as a banker so i don't dislike the front row a lot of them are my friends it's who i am it's who my wife is it's who my family is um but i want us to understand that unless we reform the system and acknowledge our privilege and acknowledge how frustrated the back row is um, and do and, and, and implement changes in the way we think both in policy and the way we think then it's going to come up it's going it's going to it's going to be implemented from below in a very violent fashion mm -hmm. um, and, and, and in a way that is not helpful mm -hmm. you know the, the, these these so you were throwing the elites, playing it with just as bad a system. So, you know, to that degree, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not very um, optimistic because I don't see, you know, I, I think the election of 2016 was an example where, you know, the front row, the, the elite should have woke up to the fact that they, they don't know what's going on in their own country and might have thought about reforming um, their behavior. Um, but they haven't, and consequently, again, I don't think, you know, I don't think the reform is going to be. I, I, I don't, I don't think the anger is going to lessen, and that's not a good thing. Hmm. Um, so we've been chatting about the ideas in your book, uh, but for those who haven't read your book, it's it's a wonderful collection of, of photos and photos of people and places, uh, accompanied by your words. What drew you to your subject? What made you want to travel around the country, meet these forgotten Americans, these forgotten places, and then tell their story, or at least attempt to tell their story? There's two of it. One of it's just, um, just it's a personal, um, 
personal discovery as you know to, to put it another way a, a new way of thinking i mean if there's an intellectual arc to my life it's been a recognition and an acknowledgement <clears throat> and first it's a recognition and acknowledgement proper way of thinking which was very front row which was very much about i was a physicist and then i was a banker the very quantitative data approach to thinking about the world the running to the library and reading 15 books was limited and narrow and that there was a whole different way of learning which was you know to put it in academic terms ethnography was meeting people and, inter and talking to people and learning from interactions so um there was you know and then that was that, that acknowledgement to me that the prior way of thinking in this very rigid dogmatic quantitative framework with data was wrong was the financial crisis of 2008 which i was partially responsible for in my in my, in my work um so i i you know to put it in human terms i literally took long walks throughout new york city to people to, to people who know new york city i lived in brooklyn heights and i would do what i called terminus walks was i would literally take the subway to the end of the line the terminus and walk home so 20 mile walks through the city and um, with my camera and uh, taking pictures of things and letting, and my only goal was to get home. I didn't really need to know how I got home. Um, but um, along the way, I would meet people. They would see my camera and ask me to take their pictures and then I would talk to them. And then I started realizing the stories behind um, the photos were more interesting than the photos themselves. And to put it in very um, vocal terms, um, eventually i ended up walking from the i think it was a two train that, that goes up to the very top of bronx upper east uh, um uh, or, or the uh, yeah i think it was a two um i was walking home and someone you know someone said whatever you do don't go to hunts point so i went to hunts point someone tells me don't <laughs> um, um and I, I was just immediately drawn in by the physical beauty and the, and the wonderful people and so i ended up spending four years documenting um, homeless addiction in hunts point um and what, what drew me in was the personal stories and you know and, and then the intellectual process of, of actually meeting people who would have otherwise been to me data outside the uh, the corpus christi library there um and you know and people like that who i just ended up spending three basically four years writing their life stories um and uh realizing along the way on a personal side how how privileged i, I was i always knew that but in a really strong way how privileged i was but also learning how frustrated at a political angle how frustrated i was that we in this country could allow this to exist, such poverty exists, and, and not only exists, but be stigmatized. Because, you know, Hunts Point is supposed to be a dangerous place. It's supposed to be a place you don't, you know, it's, it's, don't go to Hunts Point, all these things, you know, there's mm -hmm. drugs, there's sex work. Um, there are wonderful people there, you know, 50,000 wonderful people. Yeah, what, what you, you just talked about this, one element in your book and your photography that jumped out to me was your profiling those on or what those we might classify as sitting on the margins and in some cases the extreme margins so the addicted uh, sex workers um, but in our political dialogue and or or our socio-economic discussions uh, some might classify those people as the undeserving poor however uh, your book it seems to see one of the, the goals is to um, highlight the dignity that these individuals carry and that these people deserve. Uh, why do you think it's important for readers, for audiences, for Americans in general, to recognize the dignity of these people and, and to respect them and, and, res and effectively acknowledge their lives have equal meaning as much as you or me or anyone else? I mean, I think the, you know, the, the, the moral, I mean, the moral issue is just, I mean, I just, I just believe that everybody is as valuable as everybody else in a more, in a very basic moral framework. Um, but that's also you know, pragmatically, you know, I mean, I, you know, Takesha and others in the community, I ended up, I don't want to just single out her, but, um, you know, she never had a chance, so to speak, in the 
front row world. I mean, mm-hmm. her, her mom was a sex worker. Her mom, to some degree, through whatever, she started working, um, as it were, as a prostitute at 13, 14. Um, I mean, <laughs> that's not a person who's going to go to Yale. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but, you know, it was it, when I had met her, I was working as a Wall Street trader. And, uh, you know, it's... You know, it's it, it's not a, an exaggeration to say she's as clever and as smart and as decent as uh, my Wall Street trading trading friends. If you know, it's that it's that trading spaces thing. If she had had a trading places uh, movie, if she had had a different life, she or a different path, she could easily have been a Wall Street trader. Um, she doesn't laugh. She doesn't suffer from. It. She's immensely intelligent. Um, she's she's funny as hell. Um, you know, she's got all those qualities that, uh, you know, that we were supposed to celebrate and, and say are valuable. And yet here she is mm-hmm. um, living under a bridge. Um, so, you know, there's, there's that part of it. Um, and it's just, you know, it's just like, it's just very frustrating to me because the way we intellectuals look primarily at that people like her and others is through data. She's just a she's just a, a data point, you know. It's it's like the, you know, the the deaths of despair things. People die of heroin. They only see it as you know an uptick. They only only registered them when they saw it as an uptick in in um, in, in the data. Like oh 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 Lord, you know, um, the average U.S. lifespan is decreasing. Why is that? Oh. Hmm. <laughs> You know, and, and so when it's just a data point, it's just so easy to overlook and just make and make decisions that treat these losses as um, just a just a consequence of doing business. Hmm. You know, it's kind of like, oh, we're going to move we're going to move factories over to China, um, but, but there's a loss in the spreadsheet, which is you know these communities are going to lose jobs. Uh, that's okay, but these other communities are going to gain more, so we just ignore it. But when you go to those communities, like I did. I mean, it's not just a, it's not just a, it's not just a, 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 a negative column, a negative cell in the spreadsheet. It's, it's people's lives destroyed. It's mm-hmm. communities destroyed. It's, it's whole ways of thinking about the world destroyed. It's, it's, it's like people having, you know, it's like having your backbone ripped out of you mm-hmm. and that, you know, your source of meaning, your source of importance in the world. Um, you know, it's almost like if the front row, you know, if, if all of a sudden tomorrow, you know, um, an alien, ex, you know, or, or, or God appeared and said, nope, you, science is wrong. Like the front row would go, oh, no, my whole, my whole, my, my whole, my whole source of importance is gone, mm-hmm. you know, um, or somebody, find, you know, someone finds out that your, your resume is fake and you didn't actually get a PhD from Harvard, you know, their, their whole life will collapse. You take you take faith and you take someone's job and you take their community away from them. It just, just collapses everything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's, it, and again, when it's easy, you know, one of the problems when you don't think that everybody is as valuable as everybody else, you, if you take that to this logical conclusion, you get very ugly results. Mm-hmm. I mean, it effectively leads to, you know, um, to eliminating the weak. Mm-hmm. Social Darwinism. Yeah, almost. Uh, again, going back to your book, uh, uh, when I was leafing through it and looking at the photos and trying to place it in a larger historical context, I saw it sitting uh, in the lineage of let us now praise famous men and uh, how the other half lives. And it seemed to me that, that the same story or the same refrain keeps appearing in industrial and now post-industrial America. That is that uh, muckrakers or authors or journalists shine a light on different elements or different populations overlooked or forgotten America. And there is some outrage or there's some stories written about it and then it fades away and 30, 40 years later, 50 years later, the same story is told. Uh, One, do you see dignity falling into that tradition of let us now praise famous men and how the other half lives and why do you think why do you think that refrain keeps resurfacing in the public dialogue i think um 
I mean, I, I'm, I'm flattered that people have compared it to those. I, I, I myself have not, inten I've intentionally not read those because one of the things when you're working on a project, at least for me, is I want to be without context. Oh, I want to intellectually be freed up to kind of come to my own conclusions and not be weighed down by, you know, what came before me and, 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 and be influenced in a way that it doesn't allow me to really just kind of, add, that, that's kind of my old school sign. You know, I just want to, I want to see what I see without, you know, being, um, uh, uh, being swayed into a, a way, a particular way of thinking. Um, I mean, I think, you know, I don't think we can get rid of hierarchies. I just don't think we can. I think humans, you know, I, I don't believe in sociobiology. I think anytime it goes there, it, it's, I just go like, ah, no. <laughs> but there is something to be said that, you know, throughout history, there's this, there's always going to be a ruling elite, and they're always going to try to, to morally justify, you know, to put it in the, I put it in the framework of the sacred and profane. They mm -hmm. always will try to define themselves as sacred, and everything else is profane to give themselves a sense of, you know, um, moral superiority mm -hmm. that makes them feel good about themselves. Um, and it just gets, it just gets, and so the people who come along, you know, like people in the past have and said, well, look, there's this awful sub subgroup that is being treated like crap. You, you can't be moral if that's happening. Um, you know, eventually over time, they, 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 I don't want to be too cynical, but they readjust their framework to, 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 to acknowledge that problem. And then it's like, it's like a rug in a room, a rug too big for the room. And they push down that, that bubble and it pops up someplace else. Um, you know, they fix things and to, you know, things are better now in many ways, economically, certainly, um, than they were in the thirties and the twenties. Um, you know, people, people have more comfortable lives. If you're in the back row, you physically have a more comfortable life in many ways. Um, but the, the bubble that's popping up now is a sense of um, feeling like you have no place. Mm -hmm. um, you don't fit in and that there's this dominant ideology that basically um, devalues anybody who's not a member of it. Mm -hmm. And so they've redressed it up now to say, again, going back to our earliest question, they've redressed it. They've acknowledged the problem that there was this ruling elite that you know, was out of touch and, yeah, was, was was didn't allow new members, so now they have a pathway for new members. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and but is but and, and is that better than the old one? I mean, in some ways, yes; in some ways, no. Because um, yes, they're, they they add new members to it, um, but uh, but it makes the people on the outside feel even worse. You know, I want to. I mean, I I often say in my darker moments that um, in some senses maybe a an explicit system like a monarchy was quote better or more fair because at least when you're at the bottom you knew it was rigged against you and you had you know, and it wasn't your fault it was just mm -hmm. that's just the way it was it was rigged against you um and you could build your own you could acknowledge that and then build and then build your own subculture that allowed you to find meaning in the way you wanted to find meaning through through your local community through your faith faith through um, geography through whatever and you could and you could celebrate your differences um by saying we're not that we have this but now everybody feels like they have to be you know there's a path there's a there's a minuscule pathway to the other other life so that everybody's striving to be and if you're not striving to be it you're miserable mm -hmm. so it, it, it just put it and, and then on, on top of it the people in the front row themselves are not Particularly happy either because they're always comparing themselves to the next person above them. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the lessons I learned in banking was um, here are these people who had lots of money and they were miserable mm -hmm. <laughs> because they were, because the guy next to them was making more money than they were. So it's, it's, it's this really odd system we've built where almost nobody is happy um, except for the very, 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 very top few. Hmm. Do you see this as uniquely American or do you see this as a, a a product of what we, you know, what we would have called the Western, but now we would say the developed world. I think it's we, we we're exporting it. You know, I mean, um, we're 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 certainly, you know, I, 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 we're, we're certainly the dominant power in so many ways, and 
we export our ideology, our, our, our if you want to call it faux meritocracy, educational meritocracy, I don't know what you want to call it, neoliberal, whatever, um, consumerism, um, this, this kind of framework that really only values one form of meaning, which is the material. It only values, you know, how much money you have and how big your resume is and kind of looks at any any form of meaning that isn't about you know education is, is devalued like faith and place and race um in national identity all those things are considered secondary and and, and because the, we're exporting that um and we expect uh, to the point where we bomb other countries forcing them to have it mm -hmm. um you know i mean uh, I think there's a lot to be said for localism and people and, and forms of meaning and forms of, of, of and, you know, a form of nationalism um, that celebrates um, um, being 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 who you are, being being your culture um, that isn't about you know the, the uniformity of uh, McDonald's franchise and every you know every neighborhood or the uniformity of a strip mall or the uniformity of you know all 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 have the same companies and places where they celebrate family more where they celebrate um faith more where they celebrate local, localism more i think you know i um i went uh went in august to jakarta and i spent time in the kampongs of Jarda, which are their slums it's a nice phrase for slum um and you know you know, a lot of these places, you know, yes, things are very bad, but at the same time, there's a lot of community there. Um, and I don't know which, you know, I don't want to say, I'm not going to be one of those people who say that, you know, it was better in the past. And I, I'm, not, I'm going to acknowledge that, you know, I mean, the world is much wealthier. There's not as much poverty. There's not as much childhood death. There's wonderful things that science, science and rationality has brought us. But it, I feel like we're throwing out the, to get there, we're throwing out the baby with the bath mm -hmm. water. We can celebrate cultural successes. You can celebrate those things. And at the same time, also celebrate uh, faith, also celebrate um, national, national identity, also celebrate um, community, local communities. You know, someone in a review from a book said it better than I could, it says that the environment we produce is not conducive to community health. And I think that's just a really nice way of framing it. It's like, it's very hard, <laughs> you know, the girl, the, the young woman in the East LA McDonald's who, you know, was being basically um, being um, stigmatized or at least um, being punished in some ways for, for staying and staying home and helping out her mother. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I don't know. I don't know if that's a good society to have. Mm -hmm. I, I'm glad we've been talking about community and localism, and I'm glad you mentioned that anecdote uh, from earlier in our conversation about the young woman in LA. Um, earlier, early this year, over President's Day weekend, uh, I saw you speak in, in New York City at New York Encounter. It was a great, great talk, by the way, and seems like a lifetime ago. So this is pre-COVID-19. Um, and one element from that talk that really been hanging in my imagination since then is this idea of place and how you talked about um, during that event in February and we talked about today and you talk about in your book, the idea that people are wedded to a certain place due to uh, family connections, due to circumstance, due to economic conditions, but there's a certain connection there that they're unwilling to sever. Uh, we, during this COVID-19 pandemic, we're seeing the opposite from the affluent. Uh, there's been story after story about affluent New Yorkers fleeing to Long Island, the Hudson River Valley, New England. Uh, yesterday, I heard a story in NPR about uh, Sun Valley is popping with, uh, still pro with private jets flying in. And what does that contrast say to you in light of the, the work you've done, in light of your book, Dignity? this different value um, that is emphasized when we discuss place. Right. I mean, I mean, there's so much going on with the response. I mean, there's such a, <laughs> there's such a, I mean, COVID-19 and the response to has, has, has exposed many things or illustrated many things, but it, 
I don't think it's, I don't think anything, it's, it's, I don't think it's illustrated anything as much as it's illustrated inequality. You know, people have had to deal with um, the situation. You know, the, you know, I think I, I wrote a little silly tweet talking about the 10 different, re, 10 different, you know, 10 different elitism, uh, 10 different um, places of uh, how you behave to COVID-19. Or COVID-19 <laughs> like number one is the very wealthy who are in Manchester making videos of themselves singing annoying songs, you know. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> number, number two was, you know, the professional class who is that what you're talking about, which is basically fleeing New York City and going to other places and infecting the other places. Um, you know, it, it both show, it shows two things. And then, you know, at the very bottom is the homeless who, you know, are, are, are screwed. Um, you know, socially, um, um, you know, staying in place requires resources that they just don't have. I mean, it's just, I, I always call it the laundromat barrier. I mean, it's like the wealthy don't understand laundromats. I mean, they don't have to go to the laundromat. You know, if you have a laundromat, um, you know, you can't stay in your house if you need to go to a laundromat. <laughs> a lot of people use laundromats. Um, so, um, it also just shows that they don't, you know, they don't, place isn't important to them, um, other than, you know, as a way to show off. Like, I have my three houses, and I'm going to go to the one that's the most isolated. Um, you know, they're, they're as happy in New York City as they are in London, as they are in Hong Kong, as they are in Singapore, as they are in, you know, um, <clears throat> as they are in um, Buenos Aires, but only in a certain neighborhoods in them. And it's the transient nature of, of front row that is both very one of their one of the refining features. But in this case, it also allows them to um, to protect themselves in a, in a, even more from from what's going down. Um, you know, it's not it's just when I when I hear people talking about the need to quarantine, I get it. I understand it. I hope everybody who listens to this quarantines. I urge you to do that. I urge you to follow the guidelines, but please, I hope, I also hope that people understand how hard that is for pe most people when you don't have a large house mm -hmm. with, you know, um, <laughs> with plenty of place, you know, if, if you're in a, if in your, if in a fourth store walk up in the Bronx and there's nine family members and a three from four different generations to three different generations and then some hangers on that just kind of joined because <laughs> that's how life rolls um, with one bathroom, <laughs> you know, no, that's, that's very mean and just not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. You're not going to do that. Um, similarly, if you're in a trailer park in you know, Western Maryland and four or five people trying to stay in one trailer, you know, with, where are you going to put storage? No, it's not going to happen. Um, and so the framework that we're thinking about what's going on right now is, again, it's a very elite dominated. We got to do this. Quarantine and stay. What, what's it called? Stay in place, I think it's called. There's whatever. Shelter in place, I think, right? What? Shelter in place? I mean, shelter, I mean, shelter in place is like, shelter in place is, is like, there's a lot of work being done by place. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, um, if your place, shelter in place is a lot easier if you have a large home mm -hmm. um, with a pool and, you know, and you just went out and bought five deep freezers to store stuff so you, you never run out of, um, you know, and you got your latte machine in your house, <laughs> you know, and then, then if you're in a fifth floor walk up in the Bronx with one bathroom and shitty Wi-Fi, and if, if you even have Wi-Fi, mm -hmm. you know, and so uh, I think it's just, it's just very frustrating to me to see um, the, the framework of people who don't understand why someone wouldn't be sheltering in place mm -hmm. and how hard that is for most people and how some people are just not going to do it. I mean, it's just like, they can't, I mean, it's just physically impossible to, to, to be with your family members uh, in, in a space that's small. Do you find the COVID-19 pandemics reshaped how you looked, have you, how, pardon me, do you feel the pandemics reshaped some of the conclusions you reached with dignity or some of the ideas you were toying with and uh, or trying to work out with dignity? Do you think it's, impacting it one of the things that's one of the things that's kind of frustrating to me about about that question is i i feel like it reinforces what i i feel like the lessons are being learned are what i was screaming about 
And I don't want to scream about that because that seems like so that's what everybody's doing. Everybody says, <laughs> this fits what I said before, but I really think that <laughs> this fits what I said before, which is that there's massive inequality in the US and you can see how that's how that's taking place. And um, I mean, it's just, you know, go on to, go on to, go on to Twitter or go on to anywhere and see the, you know, the, the, the 30 celebrities singing, you know, Imagine by John mm -hmm. Lennon from their mansions versus, you know, if you're, if you're in the Bronx, go out, and go out down to, you know, go to Hunts Point Avenue and see, you know, or, or go to 135th Street or <laughs> like, no, people can't shelter in place. Um, it's a very different experience, but also I think, one of the things that, one of the few political changes I've had in my life that's been very dramatic, um, that one of the few few political lessons I draw from the book is that I'm I'm not a, I'm not a believer in globalism anymore. All right, I, I think we should rethink globalism. I think we should rethink why we why we've outsourced all our jobs, so much of our essential manufacturing to China and Mexico. Um, I happen to be because I, I come at come at it from a Catholic background. I happen to be very pro immigration. I happen to be pro for accepting a lot of refugees in this country, and I, I will never that will never change. But I understand why people might be might be. I understand more why people would be on the other side of that issue. Um, but I feel very much like um, that's kind of the lessons we're learning here. Is I mean, you know. <laughs> 80% of the essential ingredients in medicine is made in China. You know, I mean, we don't have the, you know, one of the things, one of the things that is very unique about the United States and one of the strength, one of the great things about the United States is we have the ability to, um, we have everything here we need. We're one of the few places that is geographically large enough that we don't really need to trade with the rest of the world. I'm glad we do. I'm pro-trade um, to a certain degree. Um, but, but we don't need to. And I think this, this you know, and this is a lesson in the dangers of, of being so hyper, hyper, hyper connected um, and being so transient. Um, you know, the, 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 first, the first wave of this is moving through the Davos crowd. It's moving through, it, it's being spread by people who go to global conferences who are as happy in Hong Kong as they are in New York City as they are in London. And, you know, and, you know, because it's, it's it's a traveler's disease initially. Um, so I think we have to rethink both from a security standpoint and a health standpoint, but I think that that's not the reason I've came to those conclusions in the first place. That wasn't about security. It's about the fact that, you know, when you take away people's sense of importance of place, it takes a lot away from them. And if we're all, if we're moving the globe to being this, 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 this place that every, where every country looks the same and values the same things, that's that's bulldozing over a lot of forms of meaning and a lot of um, a lot of very important ways of thinking. Um, you know, in that sense, I'm very much a liberal in celebrating diversity. I'm very I'm very glad there are other cultures and other countries that celebrate that have a different way of thinking and a different way of um, uh, and different religions that have a different way of um, looking at the world. I think we should try to allow those to exist without trying to bully them into, into, into doing what we do. Mm -hmm. So everyone we're talking with uh, in, this, in our series CRC chats, we're asking what is one thing that's helping you cope with this time, with this COVID-19 pandemic? Um, for me, it's, um, it's no, I mean, I don't know if it's, if it's as much coping as knowing that I have a, you know, it's, it's a, re a re realization of how privileged I am to be able to have the house I have and the space I have. And, you know, to have the family support we have and this and from my kids. And in that sense, it's, it's made me very aware of how privileged I am and that, you know, and, and, and having a family that um, both supports me and I support them. So that helps me cope in some ways. Um, but it also is frustrating because it makes me realize, you know, you know, uh, it makes me more committed whenever this, uh, this thing is over to, to continuing on what I was doing before, which is trying to highlight that not everybody has it so good. Um, um, and, uh, uh, but on a more pragmatic level, it's video games. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've gotten really good at Madden 20. That's your guilty pleasure. So. Yes. <laughs> 
Uh, well, thank you for joining us today. This is a wonderful conversation. Um, for our audience members, Chris's book, again, is Dignity, Seeking Respect in America's Back Row. It's a wonderful read, and it's definitely worth checking out if you are sheltering in place. Thanks again for joining us, Chris. Thank you very much. <laughs>